This video concerns the broader race and IQ debate and what most informed and credentialed experts really think about it. For current subscribers, this will be a rehash of some points I've made in the last several videos, but in a much more expanded and comprehensive format. As with my videos on Stephen Jay Gould, I intend this video to be a reference that I, and I hope others, can point to in the future. In my own limited experience, I found that when people stumble across this topic, they already have a strong opinion despite being relatively uninformed of the relevant facts. For most people casually coming across this topic, any talk of IQ, and especially racial differences in IQ, is considered complete pseudoscience. I think these people would be very surprised to know that there are several sources where the relevant experts weigh in on these very issues, and for the most part are in agreement with people such as Charles Murray and Richard Herrnstein, authors of The Bell Curve, and with Arthur Jensen, the guy that kicked off the modern version of this entire controversy back in 1969. So, in order to demonstrate what many relevant experts think on this topic, we first need to define some terminology and set the parameters of debate. The two main positions on this question can be roughly divided into the hereditarian and environmentalist position. The hereditarians assert that IQ and the G-factor are meaningful and predictively valid constructs, that IQ is significantly heritable, and that group differences in IQ probably have a genetic component. Environmentalists will at minimum deny that group differences have a genetic component, but also possibly deny that individual differences have a genetic component, and may also deny the validity of IQ testing in general. For the purposes of this video, the validity of the concept of race will not be discussed. To make it simple, when I refer to a white, black, or Asian person, what I mean is that the majority of the person's ancestry 500 years ago or more lived in Northwest Europe, Sub-Saharan Africa, or Northeast Asia, respectively. The reason I say 500 years ago or more is to preclude any substantial amount of mixed-race people that would confuse this definition. I realize and acknowledge that this is a very American view of race, but the United States is where the majority of IQ testing has been done in history, going all the way back to World War I. So now that we've set the terms and parameters, I will summarize the core assertions of the hereditarian position on IQ. Then I will compare these assertions against three sources that each provide by themselves, but especially taken together, a very good indication of what real experts in the relevant fields think about these issues. For the first four assertions of the hereditarian position, I will copy them verbatim from the bell curve. Number one, there is such a thing as a general factor of cognitive ability on which human beings differ. Number two, that IQ scores are stable, although not perfectly so, over much of a person's life. Number three, that properly administered IQ tests are not demonstrably biased against social, economic, ethnic, or racial groups. And number four, that cognitive ability is substantially heritable, apparently no less than 40% and no more than 80%. The remaining assertions are in my own words, but I would claim are in agreement with the bell curve as well as other prominent IQ researchers that subscribe to the hereditarian position. So number five, that IQ scores correlate at a large to moderate level with a variety of important life outcomes, including academic achievement, occupation status, and to a lower degree with a variety of other social and life outcomes. Number six, that average IQ scores differ among racial and ethnic groups. The black-white IQ difference is supported by a large body of data and is approximately one standard deviation or 15 points. Asians and Jews score above whites, but the actual gap is hard to pin down without further data. Hispanics and Native Americans score somewhere between blacks and whites. Number seven, although blacks and whites differ in mean socioeconomic status, only a small part of the gap could be plausibly accounted for due to these average differences. Number eight, attempts to raise IQ in a systematic way have largely failed. An example of this would be the Head Start program in the United States. Initial IQ gains tend to fade out completely by adolescence. And finally, number nine, given numerous lines of evidence, it is likely that racial IQ differences have some genetic component. This final point, and in some sense the crux of this entire debate, is the source of the black-white IQ gap and whether or not it has a genetic component. Obviously, if it has shown that there is some genetic component to the black-white gap, there is probably a component across populations in general. Most hereditarians would say that based on numerous lines of circumstantial evidence, both genetics and environment probably contribute to the gap. None of the prominent researchers that I know of claim outright that this is absolutely proven and what this proportion may be. However, this paper by Arthur Jensen and Philippe Rushton speculate that for African Americans versus European Americans, it may be in the 50% range, and they weigh the existing evidence as to whether a 100% environmental or 50-50 environment genetic model better fits the evidence. 
This is about the extent of claims on this issue, at least within the academics that publish on this subject. There is one core assertion that I'm leaving out of this list, that the heritability of IQ increases with age. This phenomenon is known as the Wilson effect. I think this effect solves many paradoxes and contradictions in the IQ literature. However, I'm leaving it out because two of the sources I used in this video were published before this phenomenon was identified. However, one of the sources does recognize the increase in heritability with age as at least a well-established observation. Now, to compare this list of assertions or conclusions with what the experts actually think, we first need to define what would constitute an expert. First, IQ. Everything related to IQ, including its theoretical underpinning, its predictive validity, its malleability, and its statistical distribution among and between groups, rests firmly under the discipline of psychology. In fact, IQ is arguably the most firmly established construct in all of psychology. So anthropologists, economists, and sociologists and so on may have an opinion on IQ, but it is likely not a topic that any of them have studied in sufficient depth to be considered an expert. In terms of the heritability of IQ, the relevant experts would reside in the field of behavioral genetics. Many psychologists have expertise in this field as well, considering that the heritability of psychological traits is of great interest to many psychologists. In addition, psychologists that have a strong background in psychometrics will have the statistical sophistication necessary to understand the models used in behavioral genetics. Behavioral genetics encompasses, or at least overlaps with, both molecular genetics, where identification of specific genes is studied, and with quantitative genetics, where twin studies, kinship studies, and adoption studies data are statistically analyzed to determine to what degree a trait is heritable. It is thought that IQ is a highly polygenic trait, meaning that individual differences are probably influenced by thousands of genes, each of small effect. At some point, probably in the next 5 to 10 years, a more complete picture of the molecular genetic basis for IQ will begin to emerge, but as of 2019, quantitative genetic estimates for highly polygenic traits such as IQ are still considered to be a more accurate estimate. And one final note before getting into the sources. Two of the sources I will be using do include people that have received funding from the Pioneer Fund. If you don't know what the Pioneer Fund is, I've left a link to the Wikipedia page in the description. I can understand if the viewer may be skeptical of anyone that has received Pioneer Fund money for their research. However, in both cases, of the people that signed their name to these statements or task force papers, Pioneer Fund recipients were in the minority. In the first source, it was only one member out of eleven. In both sources, I will identify the Pioneer Fund recipients in full disclosure. Now personally, I think the whole idea that accepting money from the Pioneer Fund somehow significantly taints the objectivity of your research is highly overblown if not completely without merit. For instance, Arthur Jensen didn't appear to change any of his positions in any significant way after receiving Pioneer Fund money. So with that out of the way, let's get into the sources. The first reference I will point to as evidence of expert opinion should be well known to current viewers. This 1996 paper is the final report from a task force created by the American Psychological Association, created specifically to address media and public confusion on everything related to IQ following the release of the Bell Curve in 1994. The task force consisted of 11 members, 8 men and 3 women. One member is what modern progressives would refer to as a woman of color if you care about such things. According to Wikipedia, which you can verify here for yourself, each of these people have a PhD, most of them explicitly in psychology. Regardless of the specific field they earn their PhD in, each of them is listed as a quote psychologist in their Wikipedia entry. As far as I can determine, only one of the 11 members, Thomas Bouchard, has accepted any funding from the Pioneer Fund. That should tell you something regarding whether Pioneer Fund recipients were considered outside the mainstream in these fields. So anyway, of the nine assertions I enumerated above, this report explicitly supports eight of them. The final point is more sidestepped, or taking an agnostic position rather than refuting it. We'll go into detail on this in a moment. The second reference I will refer to is an editorial published in December of 1994 in the Wall Street Journal. This editorial was written by University of Delaware psychologist Linda Gopardson and signed by 52 university faculty members. In contrast to the American Psychological Association report just described, this article was quickly assembled on very short notice. The bell curve was released in the fall of 1994, so the author, Linda Gopertson, wanted to address what she considered to be misinformation on this topic as quickly as possible. There are a few caveats worth mentioning regarding this op-ed. Of the list of signatories shown here, 14 of them, the highlighted names including the author, received funding from the Pioneer Fund at some point. A few of the signatories were not listed as psychologists, according to Wikipedia. I've notated them here with their field or expertise, again according to Wikipedia. 
So that still leaves 38 of them that have not received grants from the Pioneer Fund. However, Linda Gopertson also provided some background on how many people were invited to sign and the reasoning provided by those who chose not to sign. A total of 131 invitations were issued, of which 100 responses were obtained by the deadline. As shown in this table, four of them agreed with the article but feared signing might jeopardize their career, and another four also agreed but were uncomfortable with the idea that their name would be placed alongside potential signatories. These people surely knew that guys like Arthur Jensen, Richard Lynn, and Philippe Russian would probably be among the signatories and didn't want their names associated with them even though they agreed with the content of the article. A further six people did not dispute the content but disagreed with the mode of presentation. Only 11 people out of the 131 solicited to sign explicitly disagreed with one or more of the points made in the article. So what is the true number of those 131 that agreed with the statement? Far more than the 52 that signed, you can be sure of that. This is something that should be strongly considered in debates such as this when you are pulling expert opinion. There are powerful deterrents for going against the academic and media orthodoxy on this topic, so you should expect some sampling bias against the hereditarians, considering many of them won't speak up due to the potential backlash. There is one criticism of this editorial that I have to acknowledge. This editorial has been accused of only representing a fringe point of view on these topics as evidenced by the 14 Pioneer Fund recipients, made all the worse by the author Linda Gobertson being a Pioneer Fund recipient herself. So there could be some potential bias in the academics invited to sign the editorial. Gopertson claimed to use the following criteria to compile the list of experts. Number one, lists of elected fellows at the American Psychological Association. Number two, lists of editorial board members of the journal Intelligence. Three, quote, tables of contents of books and journals devoted to the science of intelligence. And number four, again, quote, suggestions from other people more knowledgeable than I am about some of the sub-disciplines in the study of intelligence. The first two seem fairly objective to me, but the last two much less so. So, accusations that this editorial surveyed a biased selection of academics is a criticism that I can't entirely refute. However, given that all the signatories are university faculty, and some are quite distinguished in their field of expertise, I'll let the viewer make up their own mind. The third and final source I will use is a paper titled Survey of Expert Opinion on Intelligence and Aptitude Testing by Mark Snyderman and Stanley Rothman. These same authors expanded this paper into a book titled The IQ Controversy, The Media and Public Policy. So as some background, The Bell Curve was certainly not the first published work to ignite a media firestorm and moral panic around IQ testing and group differences. The first of these was the 1969 article in the Harvard Educational Review by Arthur Jensen. Based on what I've been able to ascertain, the media and public backlash to this article was far more ferocious than what Charles Murray received following the bell curve. It ignited a firestorm of controversy that raged throughout the 1970s, which this book tries to summarize and also determine what the true experts in the relevant fields really thought about these issues. To determine if there was anything like a consensus on this topic among the relevant experts, the author solicited responses to a questionnaire sent out to just over 1,000 academics as summarized in this table. The largest proportion of experts were from fellows and members of the American Psychological Association, with a total of 480 solicited for input. Of the 1,020 solicited, 661 responded. The authors followed up with 15% of those that did not respond and try and determine if they differed in any significant way from those that did respond. They were unable to find any such pattern. It seemed that their opinions on these topics, to the degree to which the authors were able to assess them, did not differ from those that did respond to the questionnaire. The authors also provided the expertise of the sample as shown in this table. Note that 53% are college or university faculty, 55% currently conduct research on intelligence testing, 67% had written book chapters or articles on intelligence or testing. The only caveat to the survey I feel is worth mentioning is the possible bias of the authors. Mark Snyderman has collaborated on at least one paper I know of with Richard Hernstein, who went on to co-author The Bell Curve. However, regardless of Snyderman's bias or motivation, I think the results of the survey speak for themselves. So, having introduced the three main sources, let's again revisit the nine assertions of the hereditarian position. So number one, there is such a thing as a general factor of cognitive ability on which human beings differ. I feel some context is necessary here before surveying the expert opinion. The existence of the g-factor is the reason why an IQ test result can be represented by a single number. The various subtests of an IQ test tend to be highly correlated with each other. It seems that whatever IQ tests are measuring, they're measuring something mostly in one dimension. Some people may be better at visual-spatial stuff, where others might be better at verbal similarities and so on, 
And these can be represented with special ability factors, but generally if you're good at one subtest, you're going to be good at other subtests. For a more in-depth discussion of the G-Factor and Factor analysis, check out this video. The G-Factor rubs people the wrong way because it implies that not only are smart people smart in general, but you can in a sense rank order people in intelligence. So what do the experts say about the G-Factor? From the Intelligence Knowns and Unknowns paper, quote, Thus, while the G-Factor-based hierarchy is the most widely accepted current view of structure of abilities, some theorists regard it as misleading. Note the reference of, quote, some theorists as one of the panel members, Stephen Sessi. The fact is, they state that the G-Factor-based representation of IQ is, quote, the most widely accepted current view. In the survey of expert opinion questionnaire, they ask the following question, quote, Is intelligence, as measured by intelligence tests, better described in terms of a primary general intelligence factor and subsidiary group and special ability factors, or entirely in terms of separate faculties. 58% responded that they favor some form of general intelligence factor. 13% thought separate faculties were preferable. 16% did not favor one over the other, and 13% did not respond. So of the people that had an opinion, over 80% considered the G factor to be a valid construct. Unfortunately, the mainstream science on intelligence op-ed does not directly reference the G-Factor. So overall, the existence of the G-Factor has a majority support among relevant experts, but this support is certainly not unanimous. So moving on to number two, IQ scores are stable, although not perfectly so, over much of a person's life. From the Intelligence Knowns and Unknowns paper, quote, Intelligence test scores are fairly stable during development. They also state that scores at age 18 correlate at .77 with scores obtained at age 6. From the Mainstream Science on Intelligence op-ed, quote, Individuals are not born with fixed, unchangeable levels of intelligence. No one claims they are. IQs do gradually stabilize during childhood, however, and generally change little thereafter. The Survey of Expert Opinion Questionnaire does not directly address IQ stability. From what I can tell, there doesn't seem to be much controversy in that IQ is fairly stable after adolescence. All efforts seem to be focused on raising IQ in children. So moving on to number three, properly administered IQ tests are not demonstrably biased against social, economic, ethnic, or racial groups. The Intelligence Knowns and Unknowns Task Force report firmly concludes that there is no evidence of test bias, at least against African Americans, which is the primary group of concern in this debate within the United States. Quote, The differential between the mean intelligence test scores of blacks and whites does not result from any obvious biases in test construction or administration. And another quote, considered as predictors of future performance, the tests do not seem to be biased against African Americans. Next, from the Mainstream Science on Intelligence op-ed, quote, Intelligence tests are not culturally biased against American blacks or other native-born English-speaking people in the United States. Rather, IQ scores predict equally accurately for all Americans, regardless of race and social class. Individuals who do not understand English well can be given either a nonverbal test or one in their native language. In the Survey of Expert Opinion Questionnaire, the question of racial bias was asked using a four-point scale. One equals not at all or insignificantly biased, number two is somewhat biased, number three is moderately biased, and number four extremely biased. The mean rating was 2.12, indicating that experts believe there to be some racial bias in intelligence testing, but less than what would be considered to be a moderate amount. This result actually surprised the authors because there is no empirical data to support even a small degree of bias in IQ testing. All the available data shows that IQ tests predict life outcomes equally well for blacks as they do whites in the United States. Of the prominent environmentalists that come to mind, Stephen Jay Gould, Eric Turkheimer, Richard Nisbet, and James Flynn, not one of them holds the opinion that IQ tests are racially biased against native English-speaking Americans. There really isn't any credible space to occupy in opposition to this fact. So number four, cognitive ability is substantially heritable, apparently no less than 40% and no more than 80%. The Intelligence Knowns and Unknowns report states that an average of all studies of heritability works out to about 0.5 or 50%. They also state that the heritability of IQ increases with age, reaching 75% by late adolescence. The Mainstream Science on Intelligence op-ed states, quote, Individuals differ in intelligence due to differences in both their environments and genetic heritage. Heritability estimates range from 0.4 to 0.8 on a scale of 0 to 1, most thereby indicating that genetics play a bigger role than does environment in creating IQ differences among individuals. In the Survey of Expert Opinion Questionnaire, this question was broken into several sections. 
First, respondents were presented with five potential types of evidence that would indicate a non-zero heritability of IQ. These studies included identical twins reared apart, identical twins compared to fraternal twins reared together, kinship studies, and adoption studies. 25% said they did not feel qualified to answer the question. Of the remaining, 94% checked at least one source of evidence, with 84% checking twins reared apart studies. This confirms that there is broad agreement that experts believe IQ to be somewhat heritable, or at least that the heritability is greater than zero. The next question asks the experts to quantify to what degree IQ is heritable within white Americans. 39% said there was sufficient evidence to make an estimate, 40% did not feel there was sufficient evidence, and 21% said they were not qualified to answer. Of the 39% that said there was sufficient evidence, the mean of their estimate is 0.596, or about 60% heritable. This falls right in the middle of the 40 to 80% range cited in the bell curve. The same question was then asked in regards to black Americans. This time, only 20% felt there was sufficient evidence to provide an estimate. This time, the estimate was slightly lower at 0.571. There is one additional data point worth mentioning here. If you restrict the respondent data to the Behavioral Genetics Association, 76% of them thought there was sufficient evidence to provide an estimate, but the mean heritability estimate was still about 60%. So recall what I said earlier, that IQ heritability expertise is within the domain of behavioral genetics, although many psychologists will have this expertise as well. So overall, the majority of respondents thought that IQ heritability is greater than zero. As to the exact figure, only a minority felt they had the expertise and felt the evidence could provide an estimate. For white and black Americans, this came out to an average heritability of about 60%. In addition, when restricted to the respondents that you would expect to be the most informed on this topic, over three quarters of them felt there was enough evidence and that the figure is also about 60%. So number five, IQ scores correlate at a large to moderate level with a variety of important life outcomes, including academic achievement, job performance, and to a lower degree with a variety of other social and life outcomes. Using Cohen's guidelines, a correlation of 0.5 is considered large and a correlation of 0.3 is considered moderate. The Intelligence Knowns and Unknowns report provides several relevant quotes. The correlation between IQ scores and grades is about 0.5. Correlation between IQ scores and total years of education are about 0.55. Scores on intelligence tests predict various measures of job performance, supervisor ratings, work samples, etc. Such correlations, which typically lie between 0.3 and 0.5, are partly restricted by the limited reliability of those measures themselves. So what they're saying here is that the predictive validity of IQ would be higher if there were more reliable ways to measure outcomes that IQ is predictive of. The Mainstream Science on Intelligence op-ed does not provide a numerical estimate, but does say, quote, High IQ is generally necessary to perform well in highly complex or fluid jobs, the professions and management. It is a considerable advantage in moderately complex jobs, crafts, clerical, and police work, but it provides less advantage in settings that require only routine decision-making or simple problem-solving. Unfortunately, the Survey of Expert Opinion questionnaire did not pull experts about the predictive validity of IQ. Overall, there is broad agreement that IQ is predictive of various measures of success, especially in academics and job performance. However, these three sources are rather sparse on the exact magnitude of these correlations. So moving on to number six, average IQ scores differ among racial and ethnic groups. The black-white IQ difference is supported by a large body of data and is approximately one standard deviation or 15 points. Asian and Jews score above whites, but the actual gap is hard to pin down without further data. Hispanics and Native Americans score somewhere between blacks and whites. The Intelligence Knowns and Unknowns report provides the following quotes. Although studies using different tests and samples yield a range of results, the black mean is typically about one standard deviation or 15 points below that of whites. In the United States, the mean intelligence test scores of Hispanics typically lie between those of blacks and whites. The report does not conclude that East Asians have higher IQ scores than whites, citing literature that shows a higher IQ, as well as some showing the same or slightly lower IQ than whites. From the Mainstream Science on Intelligence op-ed, quote, Members of all racial ethnic groups can be found at every IQ level. The bell curves of different groups overlap considerably, but groups often differ in where their members tend to cluster along the IQ line. The bell curves for some groups, Jews and East Asians, are centered somewhat higher than whites in general. Other groups, blacks and Hispanics, are centered somewhat lower than non-Hispanic whites. The bell curve for whites is centered roughly around IQ 100, the bell curve for American blacks roughly around 85, and those for different subgroups of Hispanics roughly midway between those for whites and blacks. The evidence is less definitive for exactly where above IQ 100 the bell curves for Jews and Asians are centered. 
The survey of expert opinion questionnaire did not directly pull respondents on this question. There is not really any debate on the fact that these differences are observed. The debate is about whether and how much genes may be involved in these differences. So moving on to number seven, although blacks and whites differ in mean socioeconomic status, only a small part of the gap could be plausibly accounted for due to these average differences. From the Intelligence Knowns and Unknowns report, quote, the black-white differential in test scores is not eliminated when groups or individuals are matched for socioeconomic status. Also, quote, if we exclude extreme conditions, nutrition and other biological factors that may vary with SES account for relatively little of the variance in such scores. From the Mainstream Science on Intelligence op-ed, quote, racial ethnic differences are somewhat smaller but still substantial for individuals from the same socioeconomic backgrounds. To illustrate, black students from prosperous families tend to score higher in IQ than blacks from poor families, but they score no higher on average than whites from poor families. So moving on to number eight, attempts to raise IQ in a systematic way have largely failed. From the Intelligence Knowns and Unknowns report, quote, many interventions have been shown to raise test scores and mental ability in the short run, while the program itself was in progress, but long run gains have proved more elusive. Also, quote, children who participate in Head Start and similar programs are exposed to various school-related materials and experiences for one or two years. Their test scores often go up during the course of the program, but these gains fade with time. By the end of elementary school, there are usually no significant IQ or achievement test differences between children who have been in such programs and controls who have not. More extensive interventions might be expected to produce larger and more lasting effects, but few such programs have been evaluated systematically. From the Mainstream Science on Intelligence op-ed, quote, Although the environment is important in creating IQ differences, we do not know yet how to manipulate it to raise low IQs permanently. Whether recent attempts show promise is still a matter of considerable scientific debate. And finally, number nine. Given numerous lines of evidence, it is likely that racial IQ differences have some genetic component. It is this final and most inflammatory question where the three sources differ from each other slightly. From the Intelligence Knowns and Unknowns report, quote, It is sometimes suggested that the black-white differential in psychometric intelligence is partly due to genetic differences. There is not much direct evidence on this point, but what little there is fails to support the genetic hypothesis. They then go on to cite the Eiferth study where children born of black and white fathers in occupied Germany after World War II showed no average IQ differences. I don't think the study holds up for a number of reasons, and I may do a video on the study specifically in the near future. However, this report states that differences are not due to SES and, quote, explanations based on factors of caste and culture may be appropriate, but so far have little direct empirical support. There's certainly no support for a genetic interpretation. At present, no one knows what causes this differential. The report at one point suggests that high within group heritability could be reasonably argued as evidence of a possible genetic basis for the gap, but that depends on whether the environmental gaps are large and consistent enough. This is a long quote, but I think it really gets to the heart of the argument. It is clear that genes make a substantial contribution to individual differences in intelligence test scores, at least in the white population. The fact is, however, that the high heritability of a trait within a given group has no necessary implications for the source of a difference between groups. This is now generally understood, but even though such implication is necessary, some have argued that a high heritability makes a genetic contribution to group differences more plausible, does it? That depends on one's assessment of the actual differences between the two environments. Consider Lewontin's well-known example of seeds from the same genetically variable stock that are planted in two different fields. If the plants in field X are fertilized appropriately while key nutrients are withheld from those in field Y, we have produced an entirely environmental group difference. This example works because the differences between the effective environments of X and Y are both large and consistent. Are the environmental and cultural situations of American blacks and whites also substantially and consistently different, different enough to make this a good analogy? If so, the within group heritability of IQ scores is irrelevant to the issue. Or are those situations similar enough to suggest that the analogy is inappropriate and that one can plausibly generalize from within group heritabilities? Thus, the issue ultimately comes down to a personal judgment. How different are the relevant life experiences of whites and blacks in the United States today? At present, this question has no scientific answer. From the Mainstream Science on Intelligence op-ed, quote, There is no definitive answer to why IQ bell curves differ across racial ethnic groups. The reasons for these IQ differences between groups may be markedly different from the reasons for why individuals differ among themselves within any particular group, such as whites, blacks, or Asians. 
In fact, it is wrong to assume, as many do, that the reason why some individuals in a population have high IQs but others have low IQs must be the same reason why some populations contain more such high or low IQ individuals than others. Most experts believe the environment is important in pushing the bell curves apart, but that genetics could be involved too. In the survey of expert opinion questionnaire, they asked the following question. Which of the following best characterizes your opinion on the heritability of the black-white difference in IQ? 15% said the difference is due entirely to variation in environment, 1% said the difference is due entirely to variation in genes, 45% said the difference is a product of both genetic and environmental variation, and 24% said the data are insufficient to support any reasonable opinion. So the plurality view is that both genes and environment contribute to the black-white IQ gap. Of the three sources, this one is the most explicit. The Intelligence Knowns and Unknowns report says that what little, quote, direct evidence there is, such as the Eiferth study, it fails to support the genetic hypothesis. They then laid out the possibility that it could be, given high heritability of IQ, and whether or not the environmental differences between blacks and whites was large and consistent. The Mainstream Science on Intelligence op-ed merely states that environment definitely contributes to, quote, pushing the bell curves apart, but that genes could be involved too. In this survey, we have a full 46% of the respondents saying that genes are involved, versus only 15% saying it's only due to environment. One crucial difference, in my opinion, is that we do know who wrote the APA report, and we also know who signed the Mainstream Science on Intelligence op-ed, but we do not know the identities of the survey respondents, and that may be the reason for the discrepancy here. According to Wikipedia, many of the respondents answered this question on the source of the black-white IQ difference only on the understanding that their identity would be unknown in the published report. I have not been able to track down exactly where Snyderman and Rothman wrote this, but I don't doubt that for a second. So in conclusion, these assertions about the validity of IQ, the existence of the G-factor, that people's IQ is in part passed down to their children, and that group differences in IQ may be in part due to genes, many experts, in fact the majority in many cases, agree that these assertions are supported by the evidence. Now some of you may say, who cares about polls, and maybe that's a somewhat valid critique of the mainstream science on intelligence op-ed and the survey of expert opinion, but for the intelligence knowns and unknowns report, they put together a task force and spent over a year carefully reviewing all the available evidence on these questions, and the American Psychological Association put their stamp of approval on it. And yes, while the APA report doesn't firmly support the hereditarian position on group differences, it does corroborate almost every other claim made by hereditarians. The G-factor is a real and valid construct. Ethnic groups differ in mean IQ, and it's not just because of socioeconomic factors. IQ tests are not biased against minority ethnic groups. IQ is substantially heritable and is fairly stable from a very early age. Many of these issues are perceived as controversial, but among the relevant experts, they simply are not. If you're going to mount a serious critique of these positions, this APA report is something you're going to have to grapple with. So anyway, if you've made it this far in the video, thanks for watching. Please like, subscribe, and leave a comment and all that. I'm fairly certain the YouTube algorithm savagely deranks content like this, so if you want to see more videos from this channel, I could really use your support.